very friendly hellos. Welcome to the first allocator governance call taking place on today, June 25th, 2024. On the agenda, we're going to check on on four main points. Point number one is a reminder that the Phil Dev Summit is taking place in Brussels, July 11th. We'll talk a little about what to expect on that format and how you can still get involved. Point number two is we'll be looking at a few allocator organizations that have yet to do any kind of setup. So no bookkeeping repo, no diligence, no timelines. We talked about this in the last call, wanted to check in and just share the names of who we haven't heard from, make sure those that we have, you have that verbally all cleared. I'll post that in the Slack as well. Third point is data cap refreshes have started to go out. So there's some organizations that received that data cap and others that have not. We wanted to give a forum to discuss that, what we looked at and say what next steps are, whether you received data cap refresh or not. And then the last point, point number four, is the Fiddle team has put together a very intricate KYC that's now available for allocators to use for client verifications to make sure the human you're working with in the application is who they say they are. So we have a detailed walkthrough of what that process looks like. Sub points that we'll check in with is the open issues that we have in the registry, just giving you guys a heads up on timelines. And then we kept the Spark slide from last week in case anyone has any Spark questions as they were setting that up. As always on this call, shoot a hand up or post in chat. We'll be happy to help. Today's call is on June 25th. Next call will be taking place on 09 July. If you're ever curious where these are, you can grab this slide where it has the calendar, follow this calendar, and it will automatically populate on yours, and you'll be able to track the meetings. If you're looking for this slide deck, it's available in both the Phil Allocator's private channel as well as the Phil Plus public channel on Slack. Hey, let's check in on some metrics before we get started. So every two weeks, I pull this from the Phil Pulse page. And what we're looking at is what are we seeing as far as growth and sustainability? So over the last two weeks, what we've noticed is 24 new clients who are receiving applications for data cap to go out and uh, resulted in 26 petabytes distributed. Also happy to see that we had nine newly onboarded allocators. So welcome to those of you that stood up and getting everything ready. If you have any questions, please let myself or Galen or a member of the Fiddle team let know and get whatever you need to go for. Dev Summit. Galen, can I turn this one over to you since you'll be there live and we'll walk us through it? Yes, uh, happy to. We have Dev Summit number four coming up, July 9th to 11th in Brussels. Um, there's a number of other events happening that week. Um, there's uh, a ECC event as well as some Phil Brussels um, events happening. Um, I probably won't be able to attend any of those. I'm going to be on the ground just for two days uh, specifically for this Dev Summit. We've had um, Three good ones in the past. Uh, some people on this call were able to attend. Um, they're pretty much in-person events, and they are usually geared towards developers. So more of a bit more of like a hackathon style, um, rather than sort of a very large conference where we're kind of trying to present out a lot of information. The goal of the Dev Summit is to have smaller sessions that are a little bit more of a working group focus and see what we can hack out. So. In the past, we've had an entire track for Filecoin Plus, um, and we're trying something different this time. We're going to do talks in all of the different tracks uh, that are coming up. So I think there's, uh, I think it's four or five tracks um, total. But uh, here's the, let me drop a link to the website. K-Ray also has the um, registration, Luma, uh, right there. If you can make it, if you're going to be in Brussels for those other events, you should register and attend Dev Summit, um, see what the different uh, tracks are, see what the talks are as they're posted. We'd love to see you. This is an in-person event, though. It is not really one that we um, simulcast and live stream and share out. So if you're not able to attend, there will be sort of post-event uh, breakdowns and videos uh, of, of some different things. Uh, but the event is not actually live streamed. So hopefully to see some of you there and we'll share out what we hack on. Back to you, K-Ray. <laughs> hack on is a verb. All right. Hey, let's check in on the inactive allocators. I see a few of you on the call. Wonderful. Because I have some questions and we can really get you set up quickly on this one. So as a check-in, we noticed that of the 82 newly minted allocators, 
it was around 18 that had taken no action, no pathways set up, no bookkeeping repos, no client applications. And after 90 days, we just sent a ping. Like, is this something that you still want to do? Or would you like to retool and come back at a later point in time? So any allocator that wished to remain, all we were asking for is like, what is your timeline to start onboarding client data? And if you're setting up a more tooling, like an automated path flow, we realize that takes time. Can you share with us your roadmap, your timelines, just looking for that check-in to make sure that you still want to be in the program. So the action required was if you were impacted, if you were on that list, just to leave a comment in issue six, like, yes, we're working on X, Y, and Z, and we should see it launched by late July, early August. So if we don't hear from those impacted organizations by tomorrow, June 26th, you're essentially saying, look, just kind of stepped away from this ecosystem. Maybe I'll come back, maybe I won't, which is just fine. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna sunset the data cap that was authorized, the five petabytes. And whenever you're ready, you can just welcome to reapply to the program. So those of you that have responded, thank you so much. The list you see on the right are the timelines and information we requested and received from those impacted organizations. So Twin Quasar Julian, QC, Zeta, Top Locks, Titan, IPFS, CN, Thank you so much. Those on the left, those 10 names, we haven't heard anything. So we sent pings to your application. We had it on the call, we posted in Slack. Today will be your last day. So if you still would like to remain an active allocator, please go to issue number six, linked in the slide deck right here in this, slide six, and just leave a comment. Hey, I'm Kevin, I'm with the foundation. We are a automatic allocator. Here's our roadmap. We should be up and running by this state. That's as basic as we need just to make sure that you're set. If you are a manual allocator, just give us information. Bookkeeping repo is set up, looking for clients. Here's my pathway to find those clients. So those 10 on this list, please, please respond today. Otherwise, you'll have to resubmit your application. ST Lisa, I see that you're on the call. Wonderful. I got some a ping from you in that, but I couldn't find which organization you were linked to now. I was hoping either in chat or feel free to unmute ST Lisa, which organization were you representing with the information that you provided in issue number six? Feel free to post that in chat. It should be all set. And then James, I got your DM from Picnic too. We have Picnic all set up. So no further action required for Picnic. You guys are good. If there's something that I might have missed in that, please let me know. But James, thanks for that message. You're all set on Picnic. It's wonderful. And then I have new web group in the middle right there because new web group, if you guys are on the call or you're watching this later, you said you'll be onboarding data soon. That's great. I really appreciate that. We're just looking for something a little bit more concrete. We'll be onboarding data by July 15th. Something that we can say, okay, we know that you have an action plan. We know you're taking steps. So new web group, I'll send a ping to you guys one more time. I'd hate for you to guys to have to reapply for something so basic. We just need something that we can hold you to as far as your onboard. Galen, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to add a little bit to that. Um, we understand uh, these allocators are not necessarily, you know, doing all of their business. Some of you are waiting for clients to come apply to you. Um, so give us some more information, you know, show us some other things that you're doing. How are you thinking about getting clients? Are you doing any marketing outreach? Are you posting in any other channels? Have you built any, you know, front end website or form or blog uh, or anything? Are you working with some, SPs. We also know that there are a number of allocators that are successfully onboarding clients. Uh, and we are, there are some claims from some people in the ecosystem that they are not able to get data cap fast enough. Well, if these are real clients, here's a list of allocators that are available. If you're an allocator on this list, um, you can go chase down some of these clients that are applying to other allocators and work with them too. If they seem to be a good fit for these other allocators, um, they could be working with multiple allocator pathways as long as they're meeting each of those pathways compliance goals. So if there are players in the ecosystem that want data cap, you guys have data cap. Um, 
let us know what you are going to do, uh, how you are going to deliver this service. Um, give us an update on, like we're saying, a timeline, show us some things that you're building, show us how you're trying to reach out or work with some SPs or some existing clients, something like that, um, so that we can see. And if, if it, you know, if you just needed a, a break in your prioritization, we understand this is not a problem. Uh, you know, we know that teams have a lot of different priorities on their roadmap. People building in this ecosystem are kind of constantly changing where they're able to invest those resources and being an allocator at this time may not be one of them. That is not going to be a problem if you want to reply back and say, actually, we're, you know, we've invested in another direction, or we haven't seen a lot of traction. This just has been put on the back burner and deprioritized. That's fine. We're, I'm not going to take it personally. I don't think K-Ray is either. Uh, no hard feelings. And it's also not something that will be held against you. We'll just ask people to reapply in the future um, under sort of the new application norms. So looking forward to kind of continuing to work with these teams that are um, here and building with us. And we would love to hear from you if you've gotten approved uh, and let us know. Well said. Thanks, David. All right. For those of you on the call now or watching on the recording, data cap refresh has gone out. So those of you who have used up more than 75% or typically all of your five kids, you may have noticed that last week you had a comment from Galen in your issue that was the audit review. And essentially what Galen highlighted was based off the Phil Watchdog points raised, were you taking steps to either be in compliance or quickly get within compliance? And we realize that standing this program up for the first time, very flexible and trying to really work with you, support you on that. So what Galen did was he spelled out, hey, these are what we're seeing in the steps. This is where I'd like you to take specific action in order to either get this initial allocation top off or receive more in the future. So if you were at one of those organizations waiting for the allocation, you should have seen that come through. If for whatever reason, this thing was like, you were not in compliance, it's not even close. There's no retrievability, there's no diligence, there's none of these steps, then what you're gonna have to do is reapply. We'll talk about those steps a little bit later on the call. But for those of you, you should all see an issue with a comment to that. And those are the steps you'll be taking. You might've received a full top off or a partial top off. Galen, did you want to add any more information from your findings in doing that? Sure. Yeah. Um, we saw some teams that were able to demonstrate, you know, clients are applying, uh, allocators are asking them questions, allocators are engaged, they're pulling various reports, they're working with the governance team, and the governance team says, you know, show us, show us evidence of this. Uh, you know, we're going to use Spark, the allocator and the client gets on board with Spark, um, communicates directly with Spark. These these are examples that we're looking for. When we have an application out there and uh, we say, you know, how are you going to perform, you know, bookkeeping? And in your application as an allocator, you say, I will use the tools that are available. Um, if another team shows up and builds a tool, if the Fiddle team builds one, if an, uh, another team in the ecosystem and, and you know, the broader PLN builds a tool to, that streamlines bookkeeping, the governance team may say, great, this tool looks looks really robust. It seems to meet our needs. It's not perfect, but it's the best thing we have right now. We're going to switch people over to that and ask people to use it. We kind of did a similar thing with Spark. We saw teams get on board and engage. That's what we're looking for. We understand that this is going to be a learning process. We're going to release a tool. There's going to be a delay as you figure out how to onboard to it and you know adjust to to those new expectations what we want to see is a willingness to engage with that process and that's how we determine compliance so we saw some teams they didn't necessarily have great retrieval but they were showing evidence in their client applications publicly in github of you know doing boost retrievals when we started using spark they started complying with that um, some of those teams are getting, you know, 10 PIBs. And so this is a thing that we have talked about throughout this process. We start with five. Um, the teams that are demonstrating well, we will work on 
increasing that uh, allocation size. On some of the dashboards, there sometimes there's a little confusion because what happens is if a team gets five PIBs and then in another allocation, we give them 10, um, the way that the, the chain handles this is it sets a balance as far as I know. So let's say you received five and you were down to a hundred TIBs. Um, if we then, if the rookie holders send 10 PIBs on some of the dashboards, it will say, you know, amount allocated as five minus that hundred. That's just a, a funny little first in first out accounting problem. But generally we're going to be setting that amount at 10 TIBs or at five. For some teams, we didn't see great compliance. We saw some back and forth. We didn't see perfect matching to say an allocation schedule. We didn't see a lot of evidence of KYC, but maybe those things were happening in the background and just not as publicly transparent yet. And so we you know, we're asking for some more information and maybe we're setting the next top off to be two and a half PIBs because they're still an ability for this team to kind of bring it back in line. And again, we understand that as an allocator, you are working with clients. Those clients are working with storage providers. You are not ideally playing all of those roles. So we understand that if a client shows up to you and applies and makes claims that they're going to say, work with a certain subset of SPs, if you give them a small amount of data cap, and then they turn around and work with a different subset. A good demonstration of compliance would be that you don't give a subsequent allocation because you say, client, you made a claim, that claim was not substantiated on chain based on your behavior. It was a trust but verify. If we attempted to verify, we no longer trust you. We're not giving a subsequent allocation. That same mindset is what we are doing at the governance level of saying, let's give, you know, two and a half PIBs here and see if you are able to demonstrate better compliance. And then there were a number of teams that, you know, we just didn't see much evidence back and forth of any diligence, of, you know, questions being asked, of compliance checks uh, happening before subsequent allocations were made. Uh, there was not evidence of, you know, deal distribution that met um, program requirements. So we're just not. Up, you know, going to uh, request more data cap from root key holders uh, for those projects, and those projects can reapply. And I think, um, I think, Kerry, I don't want to jump the gun. I think you have a section on reapplying, but just some logistics on um, the data cap refresh. Um, some of those are still outstanding. Uh, we started making those comments. We started working with root key holders. Um, there have been some some tooling and some Lotus issues with uh, root key holder messages. Um, so we're batching both of those top-ups as well as the uh, removal of data cap from both clients and um, previous allocators and previous notaries. We had some outstanding data cap, um, you know, from all the way back from even like uh, V2 um, notaries uh, and different LDNs and multi-sigs. Those projects have been deprecated. So we were just working on cleaning up some of that old data cap so it's just taking a little bit longer to complete both those compliance checks and um, those top-ups and removals. So stay tuned this week. I think you'll see another round of root key holder messages, um, as well as there are some new compliance reports, uh, some new teams that are ready for that review. And so those will be happening this week as well. So thank you for your patience uh, on all this. I think there's some questions in the chat. So I'm going to shut up and go uh, read those. Okay, then I'll tag in. So those of you that are next, we have 10 organizations that we're starting the audit process on. Looks like some of you already got a jump on that, seeing what things we're looking for in that process. So Genesis, you guys are one of those. Thanks for doing that. Essentially, what we're looking at is the points that Galen just spelled out. Can we verify your retrieval? Can we see your diligence? And do the SPEs that you said you were working with kind of line up? If those three are checked, everything's great. Really quick process. Why this takes a little bit longer in this first time is we're just helping 82 organizations kind of get this set up the right way. So if your name's on this list, you'll be receiving that audit taking place this week and next to get you that first round of application data cap refresh. I will say, seeing what this timeline, seeing what's being asked, this should get faster and faster. 
So by the second and third allocation top ups, rather than being these big, big applications, these big audits, it will be really quick. You'll just check a box, installing compliance. Here's my verification steps for you. You may just get that out the door quickly. So thanks for your patience in this first round. Going forward, this will only get simpler. And if your name's on this list, you'll have an application audit file for you very shortly. Now, applying. Applying is a lot simpler than it was back in 2024. If for whatever reason, you were not allocated data cap as a refresh, something was wrong, something was not done correctly, that won't ban you from the program forever, but you will have to come into compliance much more diligently and much more effectively. So you are welcome to reapply as an organization. The steps to reapply mean you don't have to wait for an open enrollment period like last time. There's a very detailed write-up in the link below. You see the blog allocator tech. It'll put together all of the steps. When you create a pull request, you fill out the air table. I will say that any organization that is reapplying to come back will receive a smaller amount of data cap in their initial tranche. They will receive heightened scrutiny on that data cap to make sure that they are within compliance. This won't just be like shed one skin, put on another. So we're going to be really looking for any organization that wishes to come back to come back and play effectively as they come into the program. I'll pause and see if anybody has any questions on any of the topics related to reapplying, the data cap coming out, or any of the inactive allocators and steps you need to take. Feel free to message I had a, and shoot in. I had yeah. a uh, re reapply, if you could go to that one, please. Just a chatty, chatty morning for me. The coffee's working, I guess. Um, we, I think we've gotten uh, three uh, applications, one of which was from the Fiddle team to do a um, Gitcoin automated flow. Excited to see that one. I think there's going to be a video on it today, um, and that one's getting approved. That also came from our um, request for allocators. Uh, I think there were two others, one that I started to review yesterday and another that was just opened um, seven hours ago. Um, again... Right now, we have a lot of existing teams that are doing manual sort of large data set style uh, diligence. What we want to see are more teams building different specific use cases. So if you're an allocator out there, rather than try to build a pathway that has this like broad approach, you know, we'll work with private data or public data. We'll work with, you know, big data sets, small data sets do a series of applications that are really targeted. That is going to show you know, more understanding of what is expected. Um, that's gonna be easier for us to do compliance checks and review. It's also going to make you a more unique uh, player in this space. And we're gonna be able to help drive traffic to you. So we have already seen um, you know, this team applying to do this Gitcoin passport. One of the things that's on the request for allocator is other auto verification bots. Um, we have a few that are in the ecosystem, but we would love to see more. We would love to see somebody build some bot that you know helps do kind of a, let's see someone make a end-to-end -end tutorial onboarding where you know it's a website that has tutorials for how to use Filecoin, how to get Lotus, how to make your first deal, how to do a light note. You know, we have that maintained by um, Lotus and the foundation, but let's see a independent third-party team building it and do an allocator that just does that one narrow thing. So we'd like to see through that RFA some more specific and narrow use cases. The other thing that I want to say on this application, we've been working on sort of the structure of the application. So as it currently exists, and there was a there was a tutorial on this, so go check that tutorial. You'll open an issue in the governance repo. You'll fill out a form. Filling out that form opens some other issues and PRs. And so there's kind of a couple of pieces of this bookkeeping that get opened, you know, all together to track. Um, and that maybe can get a little confusing to know like where to go to follow along. Um, but the allocator application issue in the allocator governance repo that the one that gets opened automatically 
has your GitHub PR number, has, you know, your descriptions. It basically is a place where your answers on the form get posted. That's where we will be asking questions and kind of asking for updates or reviews or things like that. So the allocator governance issue uh, that gets opened automatically, that should kind of in some ways be seen as your 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 parent issue and everything will flow from there. So just wanted to flag that. Um, if there are problems with the allocator application workflow, we're happy to address those. Um, but again, go check the request for allocators and look at some of the options we're hoping to get. All right, back to you. Thanks, Galen. KZ, I see you're on the call. I was hoping that you could talk to us a little bit about the process you're putting in place for the Gitcoin and the KYC verification. Hey, K Ray, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear, buddy. Okay, great. Yeah, so there was a need, more or less, in the ecosystem for the a KYC check that could be done to prove sort of a, a check against the Sybil, a check for humanity of the user of GitHub. So uh, our team already has a, a KYC third-party tool that we were using for our clients, but we wanted to help create something that everyone could use. Um, so based on the, the tooling in Gitcoin, they have a tool called the Passport where you can log in with a wallet ID and essentially collect stamps that help build up a score to, to solidify, you know, that you are human, right? You have a, you have Ethereum on chain activity, you have a LinkedIn account, you have a Google account. And so you, you can collect different stamps and that will enable you to acquire points. So th this whole check is basically when you go through GitHub, it'll ask you to do the check in Gitcoin. It'll ask the client to collect the points. And then it'll it'll verify the check on the application. So for those allocators out there that are looking for a KYC tool, this could be an option for you to uh, give to your clients as one way for them to verify themselves in GitHub. Um, it doesn't have to be the only option, but again, this is something we created. So there's a short video I think, K-Ray, you're going to show that um, sort of highlights all the steps in the process. And I'll also be, be sharing that more widely in, the, in Slack and other places um, after the call. Yeah, Casey, I broke all the steps in the video into these slides. There's five. Would you mind just kind of walking through the folks on the call what these five are <clears throat> as against the slides? Sorry. Um, sure. So when um, an allocator logs into allocator.tech, you'll see a new button now if you click into a new application. There's the green button, and you can request KYC. Um, again, th this is just optional. If you do request it, you can still give out data cap. You can do, you can use all the other features. This doesn't block you from doing anything. It's just a way for you to automatically trigger the request in the application for the, for the client. So you click on the green button, it will trigger the request for the client as a comment in the application and you can inform them to log in and, and follow the steps there. So that's the first step. This is the link in the application. So the client will just click on the, the specific link that's given to them. And then once they get to the Gitcoin passport, again, they'll, they'll connect the wallet um, that will identify with their GitHub. And then the wallet will be used to connect to the stamps that they collect on Gitcoin. Yeah, this, that's the third party website, the, the passport website. They'll log in there with uh, the same wallet that they use. And like I mentioned, it's sort of this is a summary page of the number of stamps, you, you know, the points you collect from stamps. So you can scroll through the page there. You'll see a lot of different options where you can uh, acquire stamps towards 20. We, we set a value of 20 as a way to say, hey, I've proven myself in three or four different applications. And that, that's all we're really looking for. So once you hit 20 points, you're good to go. And then you can... Um, put your passport on chain. Yeah, you'll connect it. 
to, I think, um, one of the options there, you can connect it on chain and then that will trigger the, the GitHub link to come back. The bot will say, okay, you've confirmed on chain that you have collected 20 points, KYC confirmed, and it'll, it'll post the comment <clears throat> in the application. So at that point, you're good to go. Your client is then confirmed KYC and you can use that as validation for client applications again, as an option, if you want. I'll leave the video that KZ prepared here in the slide deck, but he just walked you through it live on what the steps are. So if you wanted to come back and watch this, you'll have two avenues. KZ's walkthrough that you just heard on this call in that short four minute video. KZ, were there any final thoughts on this or anything you wanted to add? No, no, just uh, if anyone has any questions, obviously feel free to reach out. Um, we, we hope it's straightforward enough and we hope that people start using it. Here, here. Well, thanks for putting that together, exciting stuff. So the next part of the call is, is kind of quick, just wanted to check in on two points. We had three new issues that came in late Friday. So just want to give you a heads up. Yes, we'll be working on these. Top blocks, we have your two requests for the pathway and bookkeeping modifications. You'll see those probably go through and land tomorrow. And then IP force, we see your bookkeeping URL change too. So we'll be getting that in. So those will all go through. I'll respond in tickets so you have a closeout date. Just want to keep you updated as we work through this. And we had this slide from Spark last week. I know that Spark has been a question from storage providers, from allocators. So just making sure that this stays top of mind. If you have any questions about Spark, posting in the Phil Allocators channel is the best place to do it. We have Will who can respond. We also have the developer team for Spark who we've added to that channel. So you can get really quick advice, questions, and anything you may have about Spark because we are looking at Spark as that retrieval rating. So please check that out. Galen? Yeah, another thing on Spark. I was like, there were some good comments uh, from um, Patrick Woodhead and the Spark team in public Slack. Um, Spark is not a requirement to use Filecoin. Spark is not a requirement to use Filecoin Plus. Um, but if you are an allocator and you say that you are going to work with public retrievable open data sets and you are adding value to the network by onboarding data that benefits anyone in the ecosystem, then we need some way of verifying that it is public and retrievable. And right now, the Spark tool and method, that standard is the best one that we have seen that indicates that an SP by and large is retrievable uh, to anyone in the ecosystem. But we are open to other teams building other standards. And so we would like to see other teams that can design a different standard, launch a tool, explain how it works, uh, you know, open source enough of it for people to audit it. We don't expect um, the entire thing uh, necessarily to have to be open source where everyone can see the whole secret sauce. But we need to, you know, we need enough people to be able to look at it and say, is this tool accurate? Uh, can it be verified? And we would be happy to offer, you know, a range of, of options. The governance team, you know, does not want there to just be one solution because then, that solution may not fit all use cases, right? So situations where an allocator is saying, well, we are actually working with private encrypted data that's not retrievable. How are we going to prove compliance at scale? Maybe that's through on-chain deal pricing. We'd love to see someone launching some bots or some evidence that shows this is how we're tracking and reporting on-chain deal pricing as evidence that this is a real client who really wants this data um, on Filecoin. So we're, we're open to seeing other things, uh, both around retrieval or other mechanisms. Uh, this is a space where we are hoping to have a lot of community support and buy-in. So just highlighting that. Well said, great point. I'm gonna open it up, open forum. If there's anything you wanna talk about, dive into while you have Casey, Galen and myself or the community, we'll be happy to pull up anything from your refresh to your check-ins, floor is yours. Oh, 
All right. Well, if anything comes up, oh, Eric, just in time. Floor is yours, bud. Eric, I see your hand. It's on your mind. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Uh, I mean, the the KYC is only for the client who applying the data cap, right? Yes, that is correct. KZ, please jump in with any clarifications you want to have. But Eric, that is for your client verification to verify that. So once the clients who uh, request the, the data caps through my uh, allocator, so I need them to submit the KYC to approve his uh, uh, his uh, uh, active account or active uh, uh, organization through this KYC procedure, right? Yeah. Hey, Eric. This is this is one way that you can do it. It's a it's a third party tool that we're providing that's free to use. Um, you might have other ways if, if you're meeting with your clients one on one, if you have records of other ways that you're connecting with them and can prove that, it, you know, you have clients. That's also fine. I think it comes back to some things Galen said before, whatever you wrote in your application as an allocator, like, I don't know how you specifically said you would be performing KYC, but however you said you were going to do it, if if this helps you do that better, then you should use the tool. If it doesn't, then you can just ignore it. It's it's optional. You don't have to do it on uh, okay. GitHub. Okay, understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Great question. Thanks for that, Eric. All right, the next call happens at 0200. We'll post these to YouTube. I'll also be posting in the allocator Slack these slides as well as the 10 organizations that we have still not heard any activity before they have their data capsules. With that, Galen, anybody else? Final thoughts? <laughs> Emojis it is. All right, everyone. As always, thanks for your time. You guys have a wonderful night, wonderful day. Cheers, everyone. Well, welcome to the second Allocator call taking place on June 25th. Let's take a look at the schedule. So this call is a mirror of what we did already. And for those of you on the call, we could maybe get through a lot of this material as quick. Since you can watch this on YouTube, we've already seen it. Since a lot of people on the call were here in the morning, we could focus on anything top of mind. Big points that we're hitting on this session is one, a reminder, the Phil Dove Summit is coming up in two weeks. Second is checking in on the inactive allocators, making sure that everyone's tracking that, setting up any technical blocks someone may have. Third is checking in on data cap renewal. And then fourth is just the reapplication process, which ties into that. We have an update on tooling for KYC checks, so we'll spend some time getting into that as well. And as always, anything you might want to dive into or spend time, we'll kind of circle back into it. So today is June 25th. The next call will be taking place on July 11th. The calendar's linked here if you want to follow along. And in terms of metrics, we've seen three big upticks. First was that there was 24 clients served over the last two weeks, which resulted in 26 petabytes going out. And that came from nine new allocators that have onboarded the program. So thanks for your time. Thanks for your work. Let us know if there's anything we can do to help. All right, Phil Dev Summit. This is July 9th and 11th, taking place in Brussels. This event will not be recorded. You have to go there live for the sessions, but it will, excuse me, it won't be live streamed, but then hopefully we'll get a recording afterwards. Most of these summits, they're meant to be a co-working time. So if there's any information you want to share or work on, this is a great chance to kind of collaborate with the community as you go forward. If you want any questions on this, here's the link in the slide deck and happy to kind of go through it if you need. All right, inactive allocators. So what we saw was that when the 82 allocators received their data cap, we had about 18 that had nothing set up, no pathways, no bookkeeping repos. So there was a proposal that was started in early May just saying, hey, is this something that we should take off? So any allocator that wants to remain in the program, if you're set up, you're good to go. This only impacted a few that had not had anything set up. 
So what we're asking for is if you still wanted to become an allocator, if you still wanted to save your data cap, to respond to issue number six, the proposal in the governance repo, just saying, hey, I'm setting up my pathway. This is my timeline. Here's what I'm working on. So the folks on this list here, Web3Mine, Nebula Block, FBG Capital, Sungyeo, and Matrix, Superb, Lighthouse, Ampool, Power, Metacorp, and Flamenco, Deep's organization, please, if you'd like to remain as an allocator, come to this issue, number 06, and just leave a comment. Here's my timeline. Here's my pathway. And what we're looking for is specifics. So new web group, I don't know if you guys are on the call or not, but I left you a comment in the issue. All we're looking for is specific. So rather than soon, have something like July 15th. What we're looking for is, again, to have that set up. All the folks here, thank you so much for taking the time to echo back. We've got you updated. Let us know if there's anything else we can do for it. So I'll pause and see if anybody has any questions or wants to chat on any of the issues with just confirming that your allocator pathway is set up. So if you've allocated data, if you've got that set up, this does not apply. This is just these folks on the call right now. Too easy. All right, data cap refresh has started to go out. So you would have seen a comment come through from Galen week after last, week before last, excuse me. And that was the first tranche of data cap. So he will leave a comment in each one of the applications, essentially saying this organization and the standards didn't meet. And you'll have to reapply if you'd like to come and do this, or it partially met, and then you have to maintain it. Galen was on the morning call if you watch the YouTube video, and he talked a lot about like, what are the standards of an allocator? So just to kind of echo that back, I think one of the goals that they're looking at overall program wide is that allocators are kind of like stepping in in this role since there's no one centralized trust and transparency board, that the allocators are the ones that look at these applications. So once that data cap goes out to the client, it still should be the allocator's role to kind of follow up to make sure that those steps that they claimed would be followed and you're showing that diligence. For any allocator that was not approved, we'll get to that next, but there's a few of you that have already kind of reached your data cap and come up for tranches. So ByteBase, VSTAR, AntAlpha, Data Preservation Labs, Non-Entropy, Genesis, LendMeMy, PhilWalla, ND Labs, and Guazai Dynamic. Some of you have already made an issue in the governance repo, just saying, hey, here's my disclosures. That's really helpful. And what we're going to be looking at doing is trying to make that a form so that rather than taking a long time to go through as we spend more time, that this gets faster and faster and faster for you. So these organizations here, you should see that renewal process kick off any day now. And then we'll be asking for information on like, hey, can you verify your storage providers, bookkeeping repo, and data retrieval? Any questions, please let me know. For any allocators that did not have their data cap renewed, what you'll need to do is we had confirmed with Galen this morning is that you can reapply. One of the things that's set up in that reapplication window is two expectations. One, it's going to be very slow. We're going to have to do a lot of background in that diligence process. And two, the data cap that's received will be in a much smaller tranche. The reapplication process is designed to be simple for the application standpoint. But any organization that didn't meet their diligence standards will need to kind of justify what is going to be different this time around. What have you updated? So there'll be a lot more information as far as like how those standards are done. Fiddle put together a good blog on their page and it outlines the steps on how you follow. Essentially, you go pull a repo, you fill out an Airtable form with your information, which pushes that back to the repo, and then that gets submitted. So again, for any organization that was not selected for a refresh, There'll be very specific steps on what was wrong with it. You can come back, reapply, and go forward with that. So I'll pause and see if this applies to anybody who might not have received a data cap refresh and wants to look at their audit or talk about it or ask any questions on the re-steps. I'll be happy to walk through anything for you. Here's one thing too. So all of the allocators, one of the steps in the applications asks about knowing KYC, knowing your customer. This can be a little bit tricky. If you work with your clients and you know who they are individually, it can be a smooth process. But there's sometimes you'll receive an application from a client and it's nice to have a KYC to ensure that there's a human on the other end of the end. 
KZ from Fiddle Labs put together a fabulous page on how to use the tooling that they've set up for KYC. And they have this whole page, which I've linked, and I'll start off here. If you come to the Fiddle, which is the File Cleaning Center Design Labs page, you'll see that they have information to try to make the tooling simple and the process as simple as possible for the notaries that are working. So in this website, you'll see that there was a new video added by KZ, and this is the KYZ check process. What this allows you to do is when you're in the Allocator Tech website, you'll notice that on an application, you'll have a new pop-up selection called Request KYC. You can see how that is on the screen. If you follow that, what it will do is it will generate this link inside of the client application. And this is essentially asking your client to verify their KYC by following these steps. When the client clicks on this link in the application, they will then connect their wallet. This wallet could be their Coinbase, their MetaMask, even their Ledger. And that wallet connection will then verify who they are as they sign in to a third-party KYC system known as Passport. Once they're in Passport, they will then enter information of their choosing. What's kind of neat about Passport is it's not just one size fits all. They can give their LinkedIn, they can give their Google address, they can give their GitHub address. And each time they give one of these points of information, they'll receive a point. Once one of your clients receives 20 points by filling out just a few of these verifications, they are then connected and will receive a badge essentially in their application on their ledger address saying they verified who they are. So you know that who you're working with is indeed the person that you're working with. So this is all set up. This will push to their chain and you can see that passport on chain. I will stress, this isn't mandatory. If you have another process in place for using KYC, please work with what works best for your organization. Fiddle's just done a good job of putting this tooling in place so that you have access to it. And this seems to work really well for them. They've also made a really quick video. KZ put this together. It's hung on their blog site that I shared earlier in the link and I'll drop in chat. And KZ is going to post this in the Filecoin Allocator Slack quick four minute video just showing you how your clients will step through and verify their KYC. So I'll pause for any questions on this KYC and I'll take a scan of the questions that have come through in the chat at the time. So floor is yours if anybody has any questions on this new updated ability to use Passport for KYC. Okay, Mike, I see your question in chat. What I'll do is I'll get through the next two slides and I'll pull that up and we can take a look at Spark together. So if anything comes up, we'll get right back to you. All right, last two issues that are just helpful to have on the radar. It's we got a couple requests for support came through last week, just wanted to check in. I'll be finishing these up tomorrow. So top blocks, I have your two new bookkeeping repos and address changes that will be finalized and pushed through. And IPFS4, same for you. I'll get that bookkeeping repo changed and merged into the main JSON file for you. So you'll see that updates come through on Wednesday. Anything delayed, let me know, but it will just be me. So you'll be all set on that. And then Spark. Spark seems to come up quite a bit. Mike, we'll get to this question. We'll talk about Spark a little bit more. So essentially, we're lucky in the program that we have access to Will Scott. And we have access to some of the Spark developers. They're inside of our private allocator channel. So anytime you ask a question inside of Slack regarding Spark, we'll have a lot of really qualified people that can kind of step in and provide us some clarification. And this might lead to the question in chat. It's from Mike. It says, hey, Kev, did you check out the message I left in your Slack this morning? Have you made any changes to Spark Retrieval? Mike, I'm going to patch over to Slack and pull up your thread because I can't think of it off the top of my head, and we'll see which specific question about Spark you have. Done. Okay, Mike, you're asking uh, if there are any allocations with any changes to your allocator, and check your last comment, what you have going on. A few days have passed. There's no update. Yeah, so there's two things going on here. It looks like that last one was the root key holder. Let me pull up your allocator and take a look. All right, Mike, let's see where we are with this.
All right. So, Mike, what we're looking at is your review right here, and we have an issue with the Spark support retrieval. Okay. We have the Venus tool. Let's see what's going on. Let me just catch my breath. So, what Galen was saying is that we partially met, made a partial refill, mixed evidence with the diligence, non compliant deal making, and no retrievables to data sets. All right. So, let's dive into the retrievability with the data sets. Let's see if I can help you with Patrick. So you see you're working with Patrick here, who's one of our Spark developers that's on this. And we have the fill plus LDN. It should work here. Got it. So I cannot answer the question on why the deal making needs to be verified with Spark, but I can tell you that it doesn't have to be your only source. One of the things with the retrievable deal making, if I'm getting your question correct, and feel free to answer in chat if I'm not, Spark was decided on as just one of the standards that could be implemented from an engineering standpoint for across the board retrieval. So if you have another way on your systems that you would like to verify retrieval, all for it. The tricky thing is it can't just be a screenshot of a partial handpicked selection. It has to be true retrieval where you're taking a sample from these and making it available for that retrieval. So Spark was just the system that was put into place but I can't say anything more about why that needs to. But other than telling you, if you can show retrieval outside of Spark, that's fine. And that's great to show. But you just have to make that available. With the caveat, it can't just be a screenshot of selected data as we go forward. Like, I want to make sure that I do right. So let me know if that's hitting your question or we should dive into anything a little bit more detailed. Joss, your question in Slack is, hey, is the KYC method for the allocator tech optional or mandatory for clients? Good question. So you should be doing KYC with your applications. You might know these applicants or you might not. This KYC step is optional for you if you'd like to use it, but the process of doing some sort of KYC is not optional. As an allocator, you should know who you're allocating that data cap to, and you should know what that storage provider process looks like. If you don't, this is a tool that you can use to show that you are doing that KYC to know your customer. If you have another system in place, that is just fine. So the tool is optional, but remember doing KYC is not. Mike, I really want to make sure that I did right by you with your question and your application, because as you come through partial, I want to make sure that we get you set up for success. So, Mike, if there's anything else that comes up, let me know. And, Mike, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send a ping in our chat to Patrick, who's on the not on the call now, but he's in our Slack, and at least we can make sure that that thread is going. I know that we had some chatter here in the main channel earlier today. And so I want to make sure that we come back. Mike, I see you posting it here right now as we go through. Yeah, that's great. Mike, it looks like you've already kicked this off. You're a firecracker of awesomeness. So I'm going to tag Patrick into that conversation and make sure that we can kind of give you an update. So thanks for flagging it on the call. I'll bump that thread to make sure that you get what you need. Hello. Sorry. Hey, Galen. Looks like I may have missed uh, missed the the slides earlier. So I apologize for that. Um, let me know if you want me to add some context anywhere. Galen, as you jumped in, we were just talking about Spark retrieval and just some of the processes that Mike was flagging about, like why do we need the V5 approvals to be based on retrievability from Spark? So I think the mm -hmm. action I was taking was to tap in Patrick, but if you had any comments on that, happily jump in. Yeah, so uh, Spark is one mechanism that a group of uh, you know people in the community have designed as a standard, as a sort of protocol platform for testing retrieval. 
And one of the things that most allocators indicated is that they would prove program compliance by saying that this is real clients with real data, adding real distributed utility to the network by onboarding public open data sets that are retrievable to anybody on the network. So if that is the case, then we need some way to test whether or not that is true and whether or not it is actually retrievable. So the governance team of you know just myself and K-Ray, we don't have the full bandwidth and capacity to design all of the different tools for everything. Um, and you know neither does Fiddle as one other ecosystem player. So Spark is a group that was already working on finding different ways to measure, test, and build dashboards for retrieval. We had worked on some things last year with um, retrieval bot and graph sync and bit swap and different types of retrieval standards. And Spark is just the one that was doing a really good job of testing it at a high scale of distributed retrievability rather than just testing sort of one piece size at a time or one deal size at a time. So if an allocator said, I want to be a V5 allocator, I want to work with public open data sets, and this data is highly retrievable, and then clients showed up and said, yes, I am a client, I'm doing data preparation on some public open data set that I, you know, I'm not the data owner, um, but I am a data preparer, and that data is adding value, so it should deserve data cap because anyone in the network could come and retrieve it and it's indexed and useful data, then the natural outcome is that we should use some mechanism like Spark to test that and verify it. So if a client is working with SPs that are not actually retrievable, then the SPs are not in compliance, the client is not in compliance, and therefore the allocator is not in compliance. That's why when we were rolling out more integrations with Spark into different bot checkers, we continue to reiterate that if you are an allocator and you are working with clients, you are going to be measured against Spark retrieval for the downstream SPs. So if you are giving data cap to clients and those clients tell you, the allocator, hey, you should give me data cap and work with me. I'm going to onboard highly useful public open data. And you give them some data cap and they turn around and they store it with only one SP that was not on your list and is not retrievable. Well, then that client is not following your requirements. So the best thing to do in that case is check flag and not give them subsequent allocations. And what we were seeing when we were doing some of the compliance checks that are still ongoing is those subsequent allocations uh, continue. And so people are seeing that the clients are not working with retrievable SPs. They're not working with the SPs that were on their initial list. And as a result, there's no evidence that that data is actually public open data. And the problem is then the allocators are not doing anything to intervene. Since they're not showing any intervention, the allocators are not in compliance themselves. So that's kind of a big, long set of words around talking about why we're using Spark. Um, but that's to say that if a team in the community wants to design and build an alternative that measures retrievability at scale, that would be great. If a team wants to design and build an alternative for something like how do we know that these public open data sets are prepared to a high standard? If they want to release a standard that says this is the tool that we're going to use to run these public open data sets against some kind of metadata or indexing standard. Great. Lots of different compliance abilities. You know, before we had the CID checker. It was very difficult at scale to know how many replicas were being onboarded, right? And then once we launched more CID checker bots, we were able to see evidence of where data was being 
over replicated and force those data preparers to do a better job of onboarding more unique and disparate data sets. So again, all this is kind of a rambling answer to, uh, to this question, but what I would love to see from the community, one, we've already seen people working with the Spark team to raise issues and help make that standard better. We've heard that there are some examples where it doesn't meet every use case, and that's great. That's ideal. There should not be one single size fits all. Uh, but then two, the other thing that I would love to see is if people in the ecosystem launched an alternative and said, well, here's an alternative to the Spark retrieval standard, and it works for this other use case. And it is, you know, open source enough that it can be um, audited and verified for legitimacy, which doesn't mean that the entire thing needs to be, you know, fully open source. It can be a you know, the Spark team uh, is a team trying to run this project. They, there could be other competing teams building competing standards. Um, and it would be great to see what, you know, has the most traction in the community and what is the most, um, you know, trusted method of proving retrieval. So sort of a ramble. Uh, KRA, happy to address other direct questions or... No, I Touch think on that's other issues. Yeah, there may be one last topic that we didn't dive into too, too much. But if anybody has any questions you want to speak to, it's allocators that did not receive a refresh mm -hmm. and then reapplying what that process will look like for. Yes. So we saw a number of allocators uh, that had completed their compliance check and are not getting refreshed. Um, there may be a few more. We're still going through some of the different. Um, compliance reviews as teams are running out. Uh, what that means is that there was not sufficient evidence that those allocators were working with clients that were going to follow uh, their expectations. There was not evidence of public clear bookkeeping. There was not evidence of interventions. There was not evidence of you know, following an allocation schedule. And the same thing that we've said again and again this, this pattern of trust and then verify is how we, the governance team, behave, is how we expect allocators to behave. It is the, the mechanism that we use of saying, we asked people to apply to be an allocator. We collected information about them. They made claims, both qualitative and quantitative. We asked the root key holders to give them an amount of data cap that they could start using with their clients did not follow their process, they're not going to get renewed. Same way that if a client shows up to you and says, oh, yes, here's a list of five minor IDs and the SPs I'm going to work with. Can I please have, you know, uh, one PIB of data cap? And you say, oh, that's not my allocation schedule. I will give you 100 TIBs. Go start making deals. You give them that 100 TIBs and they turn around and they only work with one minor ID that's not on the list they gave you. Well, you shouldn't keep working with them, right? The whole point is then we want to see evidence of these interventions where you are checking that these people are behaving the way they said. So we're checking that these allocators are behaving. So if there was not evidence of that sort of compliance, they're not going to be renewed. And in that case, there, we have moved to rolling applications. We have gotten, I think, three applications at this point, um, one of which uh, was an a application off of the RFA, the request for allocators that we brainstormed. And what we want to see now are more diverse and specialized types of allocators. So we see a lot that are doing a very similar thing. They are doing manual diligence, they're working with kind of a very large scattershot group of clients. It could be public, it could be enterprise, it could be in one region, it could be in three. We're not seeing a lot of specialization in these pathways. Um, and so what we want is more discrete pathways. We've said this from the beginning. If you are a team, you can apply to run multiple pathways that are 
unique and specialized. So design one pathway that does automated verification and gives out 64 GB of data cat for people to go do testing. And you just check, you know, that they have some kind of OAuth to avoid Sybils and you have some bots to prevent some kind of, you know, Sybil attack where you can't get DDoS or throttled. And great, now we have a specialized, specific, unique pathway that someone can make a front end for. People can go connect a wallet and get their 64 GB of data cap and go test something. Rather than saying, oh, I'm going to offer that plus a Bitcoin thing, plus a staking thing, plus a public open data thing, all under the same account. We want to see these under different applications, right? It can be the same team and, and say what you're running, uh, but run those under different applications. And, and at this point, the teams that are not getting renewed, that's going to be my advice to you. Go look at the request for allocators the RFA request for allocators. Um, there's a blog post. Uh, probably not going to be able to find it right now while I'm talking, but um, look at the different requests for allocators. It's things like, you know, we want to see examples of types of OAuth where someone could sign in. You know, the Glyph team used one that used a uh, GitHub account. You connect your GitHub account and it will give you 632 GB of data cap. What other types of OAuth could we use? Um, could we have a something that connects to Telegram and you verify with your Telegram account and get 32 GB of data cap? So we want to see more proposals like that. So go read the request for allocators, see what you could build that's a specialized targeted pathway and apply under that. If you are applying to do something that is similar to the existing set of allocators, those are going to be deprioritized. Um, we don't have the bandwidth and capacity uh, to you know, review those applications. They're just not the highest priority because we still have a number of teams in the ecosystem that have data cap available. Uh, they are not getting clients applying to them. They are ready and waiting for uh, clients. So there is not a whole lot of value add in having a hundred different, you know, multi-sig addresses that all claim to be working with the same type of client. It just makes it hard for a client to find the right place to go. It makes it hard for us to manage compliance. It just adds to a lot of additional operational overhead. So among other reasons, that's why we are not highly prioritizing reviewing and approving applications um, that are effectively redundant to what we currently have in the ecosystem. So if you didn't get um, approved to receive additional data cap, go read the RFA and see if there's a different type of allocator you could run. Galen, thanks for adding the context on that. Very helpful. I'll turn it over if there's anybody's final thoughts or anything you guys wanted to go over. The floor is yours. Anything? Found the uh, found the blog. I just had to shut my trap for a few minutes so I could type as well. Thanks, everyone. Galen, any closing thoughts before we wrap? Uh, there was another chat. Um, Batman's asking about the process for refill. I think he's asking about um, what happens when an allocator pathway has used um, up 75% or more of its data cap. Uh, the process is there will be a compliance review, sort of an audit. Um, we're still working on getting you know more tooling for this to happen automatically as it is. It's still a manual process. Um, some teams are starting to open these compliance audits themselves and provide evidence. But basically what we want to see is how many clients did you work with? Were your allocations in line with your application? Uh, 
is there evidence of due diligence? If you said that you were going to require your clients to work with three plus SPs, is that the case? Uh, do, do you show signs of intervening when a client was not following your path? And so we want to see evidence of this sort of compliance in the program. Um, when we can check that evidence and see things like, you know, do, does the retrieval bot look good for the different clients that are working in your pathway? Um, or if you said you were going to perform a KYC, excuse me, a KYC check, is there evidence of that KYC check? Um, that sort of thing. If all of that evidence is there, if it looks like you as an allocator are performing the way that you said you would in your application, if you are following your application details, then we will request more data cap from the root key holders. There's a number of those that are happening um, this week and going to be uh, pushing through um, from root key holders for additional uh, refills to the allocator. What we want to do is continue to add capacity, add runway for these teams that are doing well. So if, what we're seeing is if there is strong evidence of diligence, strong evidence of compliance, then we would like to double um, the amount of data cap that was given to the pathway. And that would get them, you know, 10 pibs of data cap instead of five, get them longer runway from one compliance check to the next. If there's mixed, you know, it looks like there's some evidence of compliance, but maybe not enough retrieval, or maybe they've only really worked with clients um, and given out first allocation. So we have yet to really see a lot of on-chain, you know, deal making happen yet. Then we might give uh, only five pibs of data cap, which again gets that team a little bit more runway for their clients to start onboarding and allows us to then, like I've said, trust but verify. And if there's maybe some good evidence, maybe some bad evidence, we're seeing some teams where we're requesting um, sort of a throttled amount of data cap um, to give them a little bit less and see if they can turn around. Uh, maybe they can show some renewed diligence. They can show some more evidence in public without us needing to chase it down. They can hold their clients to a higher standard. Um, and then, like we've said, if that if if we see greater evidence in that subsequent uh, usage, we could increase that back up. So that's sort of the process. Thank you, everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you at the Dev Summit. Next governance call falls on uh, July 9th, uh, which I think will be the Dev Summit. So we'll, we'll stay tuned. Might be doing that one, um, one of us from Brussels. Galen, before we jump, just wanted to check in. We had a request from, looks like Mike, on issue 11. Mike, I'm just pulling it up here. So Galen, before you got on the call, we were talking a little bit about Spark retrievals on this one, and this is mm -hmm. RF fill. And essentially what we have is a little bit of mixed clients, and they got a partial refill. Do you have any input mm -hmm. here? Yeah, so this is, a, this is an example where not a lot of evidence of back and forth with the clients. The client would make a claim in their application, but no, um, we didn't see as much back and forth from the allocator in public that we could track to see that the allocator was following up on these claims. Um, and so seeing, you know, similarly, clients would make claims about where the data would go, not necessarily always matching um, the, the on-chain deal making didn't necessarily always match their claims uh, and the allocator, you know, could intervene more. Um, and again, maybe some of this conversation was happening in Slack, but if, if the governance team can't see it, uh, it makes it really hard for us to know. So that's where we're, we kind of have to base this on those public um, GitHub uh, bookkeeping repos um, until additional tools are made. 
So what we want to see is sort of a, a set of justifications. Uh, it looks like, you know, there've been some comments back. We can, we're working through a lot of these. Um, these are the ones that uh, are on my plate last week and this week to read through and review, see what the allocators come back with as further evidence that they are going to enforce their program and their own requirements. And if so, uh, then we would like to do uh, two and a half PIDs of data cap from the root key holders and see how this allocator team can use that two and a half PIDs. Um, can they show some, you know, like I said, some renewed evidence of diligence in those public GitHub threads where the clients are making claims um, about how they are going to onboard? Can we see this allocator investigating those claims, verifying them, working with clients to work with reputable SPs, meeting their own um, sort of program uh, stated requirements for distribution and that sort of thing. And if we do, if we can see that if the, if the allocator and the clients start onboarding um, more in line, then after that two and a half pibs, it could go up to five. If it's in, you know, from there, could go up to 10. We'll just keep seeing. So that's on me to go review all of those, um, see what those those allocator teams have said, and then go push those requests to the root key holders for signatures. Should be happening this week. All right. If there are no other questions in um, the chat, uh, I'll probably drop and carry if, uh, if anything else comes through. Um, and then there's also the, oh, there's another for asking for help when we faced issues on Slack. Uh, I, uh, I'm not entirely sure, Harry M, uh, what your question is referring to the right person for asking for help if you have issues with Slack. If the Slack issue is something relating specifically to Slack, like how do I get in a certain channel or, or how do I contact somebody in Slack or how do I report an issue, um, there that would go through. Um, there's a different public Filecoin team that manages the public Slack, um, but then I would say the best place is probably if it's something like, how do I use a certain set of tools or how do I, you know, how do I configure something? I would say the uh, Phil plus allocators channel tagging K Ray. Um, he's usually pretty great at jumping in. And as he's saying here, um, DMA, uh, keeping those things in uh, the Slack channel. It's great if there are issues uh, in GitHub. You can you know post an issue in GitHub and get discussion on an issue in GitHub. That works too. All right, thanks everybody. Enjoy your day or or evening. We'll see you next time.